Perfect. All right, great. Um, cool, yeah, so thank you so much for having me today. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about um, some of our work called Hungry Hungry Hippos towards language modeling with state-space models. Um, so this is some work that we did, uh, I guess, late last calendar year, put it out um, early this year. Uh, and since then, there's been a, a lot of uh, some great follow-ups like Hyena, which I think you're hearing about in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and we're very excited about it. Uh, as a just a high-level preview, we're kind of interested in seeing if we can start to replace attention with some other primitives um, that that don't grow quadratically in the sequence length. And today we're talking, uh, and in H3, or in this paper, we look at state space models as one of those primitives. So before we get started, I am recording this or giving this talk from Rwanda at iClear, uh, where, where I, I am presenting this paper. So uh, I was very lucky to go on a safari yesterday. So I want to get everybody excited with some hungry, hungry hippos. Um, it was very exciting. If you ever get a chance to, to go uh, on a safari, highly recommended. So as a motivation for uh, for the talk in general, uh, I see something in the chat. Okay, um, yeah. If uh, if there's uh, you know any questions or anything, feel feel free to stop me. Um, but as a high level motivation of why we're interested in kind of replacing attention, um, one of the frontiers of foundation models in the past two years has been um, getting their context length to increase. Um, so we've seen that context length is exploding, which with things like in context learning is really important because you can feed in more and more data as context. Um, but the question we wanted to ask is, how do we make the next jump from 32K to 64K or something like that? Um, and one of the uh, things about attention is um, that attention grows quadratically in sequence length. So making the jump from 32K to 64K won't be twice as expensive. It'll actually be four times as expensive. And so we're interested in asking the question, can we replace this um, attention layer with something that's subquadratic? And in this paper, we looked at um, using state-space models to do that. So the high-level overview of the H3 paper is that we introduce a new H3 layer that uses state-space models to, to kind of replace attention. Um, H3 layers scale linearly in context length. Uh, they have no fixed context window, so you can actually just uh, have them generate text for as long as you'd like. Um, we managed to get them to replace almost all the attention layers in your transformer, except for kind of two that we kept in for, for the best quality. Um, and we found when we did that, we could actually outperform transformers in downstream quality and metrics like PPL, uh, downstream evaluations um, on, on metrics. We also introduced a new systems contribution that lets us speed up state space models. And using this uh, contribution, we scaled them up to up to 2.7 billion parameters in sequence, in, sorry, 2.7 billion parameter models. So the talk is going to be split into four parts. So uh, first, I'll give some background on state space models, and then I'll talk about H3, and then I'll talk about the systems contribution flash conf, and finally, I'll end with the experiments and empirical validation. So let's start with some background on state space models. So uh, first, let's let's actually talk about why um, kind of a primer on how generative language models are trained. Um, so these days, generative language models, kind of GPT style models, are all trained on next token prediction. So they'll get some sentence like Barack and Michelle Obama went to Harvard to visit their daughter. And the language model has to figure out what the next word is. And in particular, in this sentence, there's some context clues that will tell you that the next word is actually Malia. And that's because, you know, it's Barack and Michelle Obama, who have two daughters named Malia and Sasha. Uh, and Malia is the daughter who went to Harvard. So if they're visiting Harvard to visit their daughter, the next token is probably Malia. So the way that transformers uh, do this is that in order to kind of do this context, they will, you know, first you'll take every word in your sentence and, and embed every word, and then you'll pass those embeddings through a transformer stack. And then at the end with enough of these transformer stacks, you finally get a, a, a embedding um, and that's the output head that, that turns, uh, that comes into, yeah, that you're eventually used to, to predict the last thing. I'm sure, you know, if it's a, it's a transformers reading group, I'm sure all this is very familiar to you, just kind of laying down the foundations. So let's dive a bit more deeply into kind of this block in the middle, this transformer encoder block, and figure out where the quadratic bottleneck comes from. 
And it's really this attention mechanism. So what that attention mechanism is doing, so you can think about it as uh, comparing every token in the um, sentence, input sentence to every other token in the input sentence. And meanwhile, the, the other parts of the transformer, like the MLPs, they're all computed in parallel for each token. So you get an embedding of each token, and then you can compute the embedding um, in parallel. So that means that for long sequences, attention is really the bottleneck. And the research question is, how far can we go? Can we replace attention with a subquadratic operator? Okay, so for this paper, we wanted to turn to state-space models as a potential promising primitive to replace attention. So this is the basic equation that describes what a state-space model is. It's kind of this uh, recursive thing where you have uh, some hidden state X. So you go from some input sequence U to some output Y, and you go through some hidden state X. And it's all kind of these linear matrix operations throughout. So a couple of key properties of this recurrent formulation um, when you're doing generation, if you imagine a generative language model, what you would do is that you would feed in some input sequence U, uh, and then you would compute some hidden state, and then you'd start outputting new tokens. So when you're doing generation, when you want to output a new token, you don't actually need to process the whole input again. You can just use that hidden state to always be pr uh, pr uh, processing the next token. So that, that's what lets you get very fast generation. That's one of the nice properties of state-based models. Um, the, the generation speed doesn't depend on the, on the input sequence. This is where we also get the property for no fixed context length, because if you imagine this recurrent system, you can just let it run forever. Uh, you can just uh, kind of auto-aggressively feed in the outputs that the word that you just fed in before and pass that in, just feed it in forever. Now, a classic problem with kind of these recurrent uh, networks like that is there. there's a couple of problems. One, one challenge is that it can be very hard to train efficiently. Another problem is kind of a vanishing gradients problem. So luckily with state-based models, they also admit what's called a convolutional view. So this system on the left, you can actually provably turn into a convolution on the right, which we're uh, showing kind of with the asterisk operator. So that will be a convolution where the kernel K is actually the length of the entire input sequence. You can kind of think about that as the mechanism through which you kind of solve the vanishing gradient problem. Um, and then, of course, you can also paralyze that uh, over, over, the, uh, over um, during training. So that means that during training, you can actually get O of n log n uh, scaling in the sequence length n, which, of course, is better than O of n squared and is one of the kind of computational reasons why state-based models is a promising primitive. Of course, it's also seen really strong applications on downstream, um, on a lot of downstream models. So for example, uh, it's state of the art in, in things like audio generation, state of the art in kind of time series signal processing um, in a variety of, of application domains. So we were really interested in saying, okay, we have this powerful primitive with a nice computational characteristics. Um, can we get it to work for language? So of course, uh, this wouldn't be a machine learning talk if the answer had just been yes. When you use state-space models out of the box, uh, there's some quality and actually also some efficiency gaps. So here we're taking two state-of-the-art state state-space models, S4D and GSS. And if you just take them and replace to like, kind of take them as is and replace attention, um, you actually see a pretty big gap um, in quality on language modeling. So this is sh showing some PPL numbers on open web text. Uh, and you can see gaps of um, four to five perplexity points. For context, four to five perplexity points at that, um, when you're at that scale is kind of the difference between a 125 million parameter model and a model that is 10 times bigger. Um, so, so you really don't want to be in this regime where you're losing five perplexity points just from swapping out attention. The other thing is that state-based models, although they kind of asymptotically scale better than attention, uh, for short sequences, they actually run um, slower. So that's the red line. You can see that it takes longer than, than a transformer. So we we obviously, so for most, most standard language models, training out a sequence like 2K, um, the, this means that even though the thing is uh, theoretically more efficient, it's actually going to be slower. So we, we don't like um, those computational properties and we want to figure out how to close that efficiency gap. So our goal in the paper is how can we close the quality gap and the efficiency gap? So I'll start with the quality gap and I'll talk about um, our contribution there, H3, hungry, hungry hippos. One second. All right, so our modeling 
um, contributions here are really kind of split into two parts. So the first question is, how can we understand the gap? And we're going to use some very simple, basic synthetic languages to do that. The second contribution is how can we close the gap? And for that, we introduce a new layer um, with some uh, a new layer called H3 um, to, to close that gap. All right, so let's start with the synthetic languages. So um, the, this is an example of one of the synthetic languages that we looked at, and it's called Associated Recall. Um, and it's this really simple synthetic language where you have kind of these keys and tokens, uh, and they're kind of mapped to each other. They have a unique mapping in each sequence. And the language model just has to predict, uh, just has to basically recall what that output is. So if you look at these, this sequence, um, that letter C is associated with the key one. Uh, so at the very end, when the language model sees C, it has to output the, the, the number one. So this kind of mimics some uh, sort of in-context learning uh, characteristics of language where we need to recall information from earlier in the sentence. So for example, to figure out then the next word in this uh, sentence is going to be Malia, you have to recall things like Barack, Michelle Obama, Harvard, daughter, kind of put all that information together. So the first question is, okay, we have this synthetic language. Is it actually kind of indicative at all of the gaps that we see between SSMs and attention? Uh, so we put together a really simple setup where we, uh, a very toy example that can be solved kind of in two layers. You can run it in kind of five minutes. Uh, we trained it with next token prediction and evaluated um, kind of the performance on the very last token. And we ran everything with very small two layer models. And what we found is that, um, Attention can solve this great. With two layers, uh, you can get 100% uh, accuracy on these synthetic tasks. Um, but the state-space models fail to solve them completely. So uh, here you're seeing performances that are almost random guessing. Um, so, so very bad performance for the state-space models. OK, so we have this synthetic uh, task that um, there's kind of this gap between SSMs and detention. So we're going to use this synthetic task and figure out, okay, we're going to close the gap on this specific task. The way we do that is we introduce a slightly different layer called H3 that is built on SSMs, but has a couple um, different key pieces. So the design is, uh, the biggest change is that we're going to stack two SSMs instead of one. Um, the way you can think of that first SSM, that shift SSM, uh, you can either think of it as a very short convolution over the input sequence, like a very short um, local convolution over the input. Um, you can think of it as performing a local lookup across the sequence. And we're going to initialize it to do something extremely simple to solve this um, problem, which I'll talk about in, in the next slide. Then you have a diagonal SSM. So this is going to be, you can really think of it as a, a convolution that can have global memory. So we're going to initialize it um, so that it can uh, kind of have some weights that, that have global, global memory, and then we'll kind of let it learn the weights over time. Uh, and the last important piece is that there's these multiplicative interactions between kind of different projections of the, of the input. So that's kind of these teal dots here. That means that you're going to take three projections of the input, run one of the projections through the shift SSM, um, and then do a multiplicative interaction uh, with, with another input, uh, run that through the diagonal SSM, um, and do the multiplicative interaction uh, with, with the last output. Uh, if you're familiar with the hyena architecture at all, so hyena takes this simple thing and kind of generalizes a bit. You replace the diagonal SSM with something else, and you add a couple more small uh, convolutions to the input. Um, but but that's kind of, these are kind of the key pieces. So stacking two different SSMs with kind of different properties, uh, then using those multiplicative interactions. Okay, so we're going to initialize the shift SSM to just remember the previous token and just spit it out in the next time step. So what does that mean? So we're going to initialize the matrices of that little shift SSM there to say, okay, let's say we have some input, Barack and Michelle Obama. On the first time step, we've just uh, we didn't see anything else before, so we're just going to have this module output a null token. On the next step, it's going to output the thing that it just previously saw. So on the second step, it will output Barack. The third step, it will output and. On the fourth step, it will output Michelle. Um, kind of etc. The diagonal SSM is going to remember kind of what it sees uh, forever. So if you kind of take that SSM in isolation. Uh, and run it through the exact same example. It's going to output remember Barack and output Barack and output Barack and output Barack over and over again. 
Uh, one thing I'll note is that uh, the gate, so the, the reason that kind of those gating interactions are important is that this allows you to kind of selectively remember or selectively choose what you're going to remember in the diagonal SSM. So uh, if you imagine that uh, for some reason through the skating mechanism, if in the first two steps, uh, you don't pass anything into the diagonal SSM, um, then in later steps when you, the first time that you see something, that's what you're going to remember for the rest of the sequence. So this mechanism is kind of how we're going to actually do the association of um, like when when you see a key value pair for the first time, uh, you're you're going to know that, OK, now is my time to remember this key value pair for for the entire sequence. OK, so that's kind of the, the key pieces, the, the important ideas. And now we're going to cover how H3 can actually solve associative recall. OK, so we're going to take a very simplified version of uh, the associative recall that we saw before, just a few tokens. Uh, that's going to be A4, C2, B3, C, and then next the model has to predict that two is the next thing that it needs to see. And we're going to focus in on kind of one particular uh, dimension, like kind of hidden dimension of, of one of these H3 layers. We're going to specialize it just for the C token. So we're just going to kind of look at a very um, small, like kind of a model dimension equals one uh, example where um, uh, where we see how you can kind of encode the value for C just kind of in one bit of information. And so the way we're going to do that specialization is we're going to initially just hard code the Q, K, and V projections to do something very specific. So that V projection, uh, uh, that V projection, you can think of as kind of a pass-through operator. So um, you have some input, and then the V operation is just going to send it through. Meanwhile, the Q and the K, they're going to check for whether uh, am I currently seeing the token called C. So if uh, you pass in an A, Q and the K are like, oh, that's not a C, so I'm going to pass through a zero. And for the V, I'm going to pass through uh, the value A. OK, so next, uh, so uh, if we see the, if we actually see the key C, then Q and K are going to uh, pass through a one, and V is again going to pass through the token. Uh, lastly, if you see some value like four, again, Q and K are going to be like, oh, that's not C, and the V is, uh, projection is going to pass through the value. OK, so we've set all those pieces together. The shift SSM does some, uh, it's just going to remember, just spit out the previous token. The diagonal SSM is going to have some global memory that we can control over the sequence. And Q, K, and V are just going to kind of light up um, when you see the, the key C. All right, so let's walk through kind of what happens when you, when you, walk th when you uh, feed in a sequence like we see above. OK, so the first step is uh, we, we see this key A. So uh, that V projection, it's going to pass through that A, but the Q and the K, they're both going to be outputting zeros. Um, so because Q and K are zeros, you kind of get zeros throughout the network. Um, and that multiplicative interaction says, hey, this is not a C. Uh, we can safely ignore it. Um, and this, this particular dimension won't output anything. So next, we're going to see um, four. Uh, and the exact same thing that's gonna, uh, like that is going to happen. One important thing to note here is that the shift matrix here is actually outputting a zero because the thing that it saw in the previous step was a zero. And that's about to be um, uh, slightly important. And now we get kind of to the first interesting thing. So we see the C, Q and K light up. So they're going to send ones through. The shift SSM is still outputting a zero because that, that is kind of what it saw on the previous step. Um, and uh, because it saw the zero on the previous step, um, it's uh, the, the entire, we're not actually going to send anything into the diagonal SSM. So even though uh, kind of we, we've sent the C forward in the V, um, because the shift SSM saw a zero on the previous step, it's still going to send a zero. Um, let me see. If you can see my mouse, that's kind of what's happening over here. Um, and so you get zeros out and then still zeros throughout. And now here's where uh, the shift SSM is basically acting like a local lookup to do a key value association between the key C and the value 2. So because the shift SSM saw a 1 on the previous step, now it's going to output a 1. So now let's trace what happens to this uh, value projection. So you see this 2. It goes through the V value projection and outputs a 2. And now it hits this multiplicative gate. And so now for the first time, you have a 2 times 1. And now your output is 2. <clears throat> 
And so now you have this output two that is walking through and, and hitting the uh, diagonal SSM. And the diagonal SSM is going to be able to remember it uh, for the rest of the sequence. And it, in fact, is already outputting it. Um, but of course, uh, the model should not do something like, oh, I just saw a two, so I'm going to predict that the next token is going to be a two. That wouldn't be correct behavior. Um, so that's kind of what this last Q projection is doing. So this Q is still says, okay, I'm not seeing a C right now. So it's a zero. So even though the diagonal SSM is outputting a two, you're going to get a zero times two and you still output a zero. This is important for the next step as well, because the diagonal SSM has remembered kind of this value um, and it'll remember it and output it for the rest of the sequence. But the way that you make sure that the layer isn't kind of outputting the wrong answer is that this Q gate over here is preventing um, the diagonal SSM from outputting the answer unless you see a C. In this case, you're seeing a B, so you send a zero through zero times two is zero, so you get an output of zero. Uh, the same thing happens on the next step. Uh, again, you, you have a, uh, of course, the, the value three is not the letter C. Um, so again, you get a zero through the Q projection uh, and an output of a zero. And now here on the last step is where all the magic happens and where we finally get a good predict prediction. So you see this value C, Q and K light up. It's going to send a one to the shift SSM. It's also going to send a one to the uh, to the through the Q projection. So this one is now going to activate this gate and say, "Okay, diagonal SSM, you can finally uh, we're going to let through this prediction that you've been making um, the whole time." Uh, and now the entire layer can predict that the next token should be a two. So basically, each uh, you know dimension. Um, uh, of an H3 model can memorize the value for a single key. Um, the number of like kind of the width of the H3 layer kind of needs to grow um, sort of similarly to the model width. Um, and this is how H3, this like kind of hand engineered um, little, little layer can solve associated recall. Of course, so we can uh, we can write out weights that will do this. But one of the questions is if you just train an H3 layer from scratch, does it learn it? Um, it turns out, yeah, so H3 can basically close the gap um, with transformers on the associated recall task. So that's this last layer down here. You can see it, it almost matches transformers. And kind of more importantly, when we close the gap on this synthetic task, we can now start to close the gap on the actual language modeling task that we care about. So uh, if we take H3, replace all the attention layers, we come within 0.4 PPL perplexity points of the transformer. One cool thing we actually found is that if you take this H3 model and kind of combine it back with attention, so kind of this hybrid SSM and attention architecture, you can actually start to beat transformers by one perplexity point. That was very exciting. So this is the model that we ended up scaling up for this paper, uh, H3 with, with two attention layers. Speaking of scaling up, okay, so how did we actually make all this performant um, and make it so that, so that we could start outperforming um, uh, attention? So just uh, uh, as a reminder, there's this runtime efficiency gap between attention and SSMs, um, partially because you know attention has been uh, optimized um, for, for years at this point and has uh, kind of very optimized implementations. So how do we close this runtime efficiency gap? So of course, we're going to go about it the same way. So first, how can we understand this gap? And then how do we close this gap? OK, so let's talk a little bit about how we compute uh, kind of long convolutions, long SSMs with the FFT convolution. So here we've got the FFT convolution, um, U convolved with K. Um, and when you have a convolution kernel that is as long as a sequence length, uh, you kind of don't want to use like the conv1D that comes in PyTorch because that's uh, it's a naive implementation that will actually also do a uh, N squared computation. So instead what we do is we go through the FFT <clears throat> we use what's called the FFT convolution theorem. So the way that works is that we first uh, take the FFT of the input signal, the FFT of the convolution kernel, do a pointwise multiplication kind of in frequency space, and then take the inverse FFT back into time space. Now, uh, the, this operation is dominated by the FFT. And so the FFT can run an O of n log n in the input sequence, um, but is actually slower than naive attention. Um, and this is kind of where that bottleneck comes from. OK, so how do we optimize the FFT? 
to uh, to get fast to get it faster um, on on language. And there's kind of three key ideas. So the first is kernel fusion. So instead of calling kind of these four operations in PyTorch, um, we were instead going to write uh, one kernel that um, can uh, run all of these at once. And then basically, as long as your inputs can fit into GPU SRAM, um, you, uh, you save time by using less memory IO. I see something in the chat, so let me look. Right, so uh, the question is, how does FFT relate to state-space model? Um, let me go back. So recall that the way that we train, come on, the way that we train SSMs is that we turn them into a convolutional view. So we convert an SSM into uh, each SSM can generate this kernel K and we train using this. And now the question is, okay, how do we compute this convolution? Um, and the way that you do this for very long convolutions is you want to use the FFT convolution theorem. So literally this, this is kind of the naive PyTorch code that runs. So there's some convolution that goes from an SSM to this kernel K. Oh, I didn't know that could show up. Um, and then you run kind of this PyTorch code to compute the forward pass of the SSM. And of course, the, this is our bottleneck. So, so how do we speed it up? Let me check the chat again. All right, cool. Um, so how do we speed it up? So the first idea is um, if you write this in a in naive PyTorch, each of these operations needs to uh, load in the input and read out the output. And this can be very slow, uh, relatively slow on, on GPUs. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this whole operation in CUDA um, and so that it only takes one read and one write, um, as, uh, at least for shorter sequences. The next thing we're going to do is that we are going to uh, utilize tensor cores to compute the FFT uh, using using tensor cores. So uh, naively, when you compute the FFT, you kind of um, you're you doing a bunch of floating point operations or half precision operations. And on modern GPUs, this is actually um, more than ten times slower than than the, their theoretical maximum. So what we do is we're going to um, uh, replace kind of parts of that FFT with matrix multiplications, and that can kind of utilize the tensor cores on modern GPUs. And the last bit is uh, in order to scale to long sequences. So uh, for very long sequences, we can't fit them all to SRAM. So we can't do, we can't fuse the entire operation, but we can go back and use the recurrent view of state space models and use that to scale to long sequences. Okay, so the, the first bit, um, just uh, kind of rewriting the FFT convolution in CUDA uh, allows us to reduce memory IO and immediately get some speed up. So kernel fusion reduces memory IO as long as your whole sequence can fit into SRAM, and that kind of gives you that speed up from red to teal here. Um, so for some context, fitting into SRAM means, uh, you know, sequences up to kind of 4K or 8K on modern uh, A100s. Excuse me. So next we're gonna use uh, tensor cores to actually compute this FFT using the block FFT. So this is a kind of a tensor decompos a uh, tensor decomposition of, of the FFT operation. So what that says is that an FFT of length N can be, can be decomposed into shorter FFTs of length N1 and N2. And these shorter FFTs can be computed with a matrix multiplication on tensor core. Um, then there's a diagonal matrix, which is kind of a pointwise operation, uh, and then some permutations um, that, that need to be done. I see something in the chat. Does your implementation accelerate computation for GPUs without tensor cores? Um, that's a great question. Uh, so we, uh, so the short answer is no, because um, programming with tensor cores is sufficiently painful um, that, uh, you know, the, the custom CUDA code that you have to write is kind of depends on each generation of GPUs. Um, the other thing is uh, there are not a lot of GPUs left that don't have tensor cores. So tensor cores have been around since V100, um, which was kind of 2017-ish um, and are kind of continuing on in, in every GPU. So I think every um, iteration of GPUs since then has had tensor cores in some form or another. Um, I'll note it's also not specific to uh, GPUs, kind of almost every hardware accelerator 
uh, has some specialized matrix multiplication code um, because matrix multiplication is the easiest thing to speed up in hardware. Um, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, you know embarrassingly parallel. Um, so so every except hardware accelerator has custom matrix multiplication code across GPUs, TPUs, um, what have you. Oh. Okay. So this block FFT, this decomposition allows you to run these sub FFT, uh, kind of shorter FFTs on tensor cores. Okay, so this further improves the runtime for short sequences. So you go down from this teal to this green because you can kind of use the flops better on GPU. But I've drawn these little X's here, and that mean, and that is really because uh, this fusion and this block FFT can outperform transformers, but only when the entire sequence can fit into GPU SRAM. Um, so of course, the whole motivation for this was uh, we wanted to scale to longer sequences. So if your solution caps out at like 4K, then um, you know that's not great. We would like to see how can we go further than that. And that's where we come in and bring in the state passing algorithm. So the state passing alg algorithm is, is we're going to use that, that go back to their recurrent view of the state space models um, to split up the input and compute the convolution one chunk at a time. So we're really you know, taking advantage of both views of the SSMs with this algorithm. So the way that that works is we're going to split, in, split up the input into chunks of 4K or 8K. And we're going to pass it into the fused uh, FFT convolution algorithm and, and get the first output. And we are also going to produce this SSM state, this orange vector here. For the next chunk, we are going to, again, pass in the input to the FFT convolution. We're also going to pass in this state um, and then use the SSM kind of update operation to update the output. So this output will depend on both the state and the input, and that's how we get the correct, uh, the mathematically correct output, um, uh, as if we had, you know, computed the whole thing um, in sequence. And again, we're going to output the state and pass it on, um, kind of, et cetera, through the entire sequence. And that kind of lets us uh, compute the entire sequence by, you know, we're going to uh, put each of these little chunks onto SRAM, um, use the use the tensor cores, get kind of this this fast behavior, but we can also scale to long sequences. Okay. So um, this recurrent view allows us to scale to long sequences. So that's this orange line that we've drawn here. So for short sequences, it's of course is computing literally the exact same thing as before. So you get the same performance. And for longer sequences, um, we get this nice scaling behavior where um, ultimately we're you know up to two times faster than than the naive state space model. And of course, because uh, we we run in, we are scaling at n log n, we can be up to 35 times faster than attention um, at, at long sequences. Okay. Um, now let's move on to the empirical validations, uh, how we actually train some language models um, and evaluated that, that all this sort of works. So what we did is we um, took a standard transformer backbone um, and swapped out the attention layers for H3, uh, except kind of keeping two attention layers in there because we saw that that gave higher performance. Um, and there we kept one at the beginning and one in the middle. And what we found is that um, as we scaled this model up, uh, H3 sort of outperformed transformers, uh, similarly sized transformers, or sorry, transformers of the same size uh, kind of throughout. Um, so here we're looking at uh, perplexity evaluations on the pile, checking on the chat. Um, how's information passed from block to block or the computation uh, scaling plot? Which of the models combines H attention? H okay, um, so let me go into that real quick. So, so this scaling block, so this the scaling plot is literally just just the single H three layer, like comparing one one layer to one attention layer. So the, this isn't the whole model; it's just like kind of one layer of scaling. Um, and uh, you can uh, I didn't put the mathematical details of this like kind of SSM transition um, into this talk, but basically um, going if you go all the way back to the definition of an SSM. Um, back on like slide uh, five or whatever, uh, then there's a, you can just, this vector is that X vector, the, that X um, that is in that, uh, in that value. Uh, and you can, um, it's kind of, there's a very well-established 
uh, technique to take that X and then use it to, to update the output. Um, happy to talk about that uh, more offline, but um, for for the sake of time, I did not. And for the sake of time and having less math in the presentation, um, I did not include it in this presentation. Okay. Um, so back to the results. Um, so as we scaled up this model, we saw the H3 outperformed transformers. Um, so here we were training kind of on the pile uh, and uh, showing perplexity evaluations um, where uh, in perplexity lower is better. And we found that H3 outperformed transformers of the same size. Uh, these were kind of the, the, the best transformers of these sizes available at the time. Now there's kind of newer stuff. Um, but but this is well, newer stuff and also new tricks to, to train uh, GPT-like models. Uh, but uh, the, it was uh, kind of outperforming um, similar size models uh, in perplexity. Um, we saw that H3 also scaled with the data. So we ran a simple experiment where we said, okay, um, as we increase or uh, if you kind of take a fixed point and increase the amount of training tokens, um, kind of training the model and kind of decaying the learning rate the right way each time, um, will you get, uh, uh, will, will the model kind of scale the amount of training data? We saw that for a fixed amount of training data, um, H3 also performed outper outperform transformers kind of of the same size with the amount of training data with the same loss schedule and all the other hyperparameters and everything like that. Uh, we then also evaluated H3 um, on downstream tasks. So we evaluated on superglue, um, uh, and we saw that. Uh, so this table showing zero shot performance. Um, H3 uh, achieves better superglue scores than transformers of the same size. Um, H3 also does coherent generation. So for example, um, uh, I, I asked H3, I'm giving a talk at Mila to the machine learning group. I will say something nice about the group. And H3 said, the group is small, but it's the best in Cambridge. Some people may think I'm a bit overzealous, but I like making people feel good about the group. It has to be better than any place else. And this group is certainly that. I'm really looking forward to this talk. I hope that a lot of people will come and be interested by what it's all about. I'm also happy to receive any feedback about it. So, you know, like all language models, it did a little bit of hallucinations, um, but also did some coherent generation. Um, I also asked it to describe itself. So I asked the H3 model, um, you know, if there's a paper with a, with a paper title, what would the language model be about? Um, and you know, the output was all right. It talked about state spaces and talked about language modeling, making predictions. Um, apparently this talk is a little bit old. Apparently this paper was actually published in ICML 2013, um, but you know, what can you do better late than never? Um, Another uh, nice bit is that H3 uh, enables very fast generation. So when we do kind of gener uh, generative um, tasks like, like the ones that I just showed, we use the recurrent formulation of the SSM to do generation. And that means that, um, especially as you get for longer and longer prompts, um, H3 uh, can, can get much higher throughputs and faster generation um, in terms of tokens per second, uh, up to 2.5 times faster than transformers. Um, and lastly, of course, this recurrent formulation also allows uh, infinite generation, which means you can kind of generate long form content um, as long as you like. I think I saw one example on Twitter um, where somebody used it to kind of generate this short story um, about something and they were going up to like 11,000 tokens um, and said that it was still kind of, you know, still managing to, to keep up with, um, with, the, uh, with the original narrative. Um, in our paper, uh, you can check out some other modalities that we evaluated. We, uh, we used H3 to do seizure detection from EEG um, and achieved very good results. Uh, we used it to do uh, kind of brain fMRI prediction, um, where it's actually also a very generative sequence where you're trying to predict how the brain waves are going to change in the next sequence. Um, so that was another fun application. Finally, some future directions. So uh, since the paper, we've been very interested in kind of scaling up more in parameters and sequence length. So um, we, we actually have some fun work coming out about that, um, hopefully very soon, um, kind of new versions of H3 um, scaling up at sequence length and, and in parameters. Um, we've been very interested in kind of a fundamental question of 
what is the simplest possible model that can still get good performance on these important tasks like language modeling? How can we remove the last attention layer? So we did that in the follow-up uh, called Hyena. Um, how can we remove the SSMs? We did that in, in a couple follow-ups. Um, we're also thinking, you know, how can we remove that pesky FFT? Um, and uh, you might be seeing something about that very soon as well. We're very interested in kind of the applications of this. So what does infinite context length allow us to do? Um, you know, what could you do with 128K context length? Um, what could you do with very high resolution images? Uh, this is something that we're kind of very excited about abstractly. Maybe it, maybe it you know, enables new applications, new modalities, um, things like maybe DNA sequences that are, of course, famously long. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so, so very excited about the kind of the long sequence direction in general. Okay, so in summary, uh, today I talked about H3, which is a new SSM-based layer. Uh, um, in this paper, we managed to replace almost all the attention layers in a transformer model. Um, we talked about FlashCom, which is a, a systems contribution to scale up SSMs to improve their efficiency. The upshot of everything is that we were able to outperform transformers in the models that we um, scaled up. So in this paper, we scaled up to uh, 2.7 billion parameters. Um, we were able to enable longer sequence lengths. Um, yeah, so the, thanks so much for listening to the talk. So you can find the paper and the code at these links. Um, my name is uh, Dan, and uh, you know, of course, thanks so much for having me. Um, Tree was uh, also was the other co-first author on this paper, and he couldn't make it today, um, but he sends his regards. Uh, if you go to that QR code, um, I think that leads to either the code or a blog post or something like that, um, so, so you can read more about it. Um, yeah, so thank you so much again for having me and happy to take questions. Great, thank you so much, Daniel, for this great presentation. Uh, so I'm just going to